Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we talked about dynamic memory allocation. We talked about uh, uh, we talked about uh, functions and privacy. Uh, we kind of started constructors and destructors, which are constructor, not the constructors. We haven't seen different types of constructors yet, so we don't understand that. We just saw a constructor. We call it a no argument constructor or a default constructor. No argument constructor or default con constructor. That's what we dealt with. So you are kind of ahead of the thing. So when you are actually getting the workshops and you see the workshop is asking you for weird stuff that they could use constructors to do it, just follow the workshop because that's workshop four to constructors and stuff. Workshop three is only member functions and privacy. Okay, keep that in mind. So um, if you, if in any case you want to apply uh, the knowledge of, little knowledge of constructors and destructor you have, fine by me, no problem, as long as it doesn't change the outcome of the workshop. Uh, so, uh, we talked about dynamic memory allocation, uh, so any uh, questions on the dynamic memory allocation and what we had, so uh, uh, any questions essentially on this, so any questions on this, like dynamic memory allocation and how we, how we do it? Are we all okay with this, dynamic memory allocation? Quick review on dynamic memory allocation. Uh, it can be done individually or uh, like, um, dynamically allocating an array. The individual one is not here. I removed the thing that I wrote for the integer one because the other class had problem with it. So this delete CNT is not needed in here. It has to be removed. Uh, and uh, uh, we mentioned that uh, we mentioned that uh, um, the action of new and delete happens at runtime. It's something that your your executable requests the the operating system for a chunk of memory that is not within the uh, scope of the executable, but it's outside of the executable somewhere. And therefore, when the executable is removed by operating system, when the execution ends, your dynamic memory remains in memory. That's why you have to delete it. And we said, however you allocate, you deallocate that way. So if you if you allocate, not like an array, it's an individual single thing, then you have to delete without square brackets. If you are actually creating like an array, you have to delete like an array. Um, next thing was uh, um, you never need to check to see if a, um, uh, a pointer is null or not because uh, that mechanism is within delete. Delete doesn't do anything when the pointer is null. So you don't need to check it, just delete it. If the pointer is null, nothing's going to happen. So you don't need to say, if pointer is not equal to null, delete. You don't need to. OK, just delete. Uh, then we created, uh, uh, students were asking, uh, um, can, dyna can dynamic memory allocation happen in one scope and deletion happens in another scope? And uh, these are all the points that they brought up in the other class. And because these are nice things to know, I am bringing them up over here too as kind of a review on DMA. If you have any problem with any part of it and you think I'm talking gobbledygook, just stop me and ask questions. Are we okay with that? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll come to that too. Uh, so I'm just at DMA. I'm not still at the, the classes. So I'm just talking dynamic memory. We'll come to that initialization stuff. So there is nothing automatic in C++. Let's put it that way. First of all, take automatic out of your brain. There is nothing automatic in C++ unless certain types of definition that comes by nature. Like when you create, comes natural, not by nature, <laughs> comes natural, which means when you create uh, an integer, the create gets the, that creation, you can tag a hook to it, so something happens when it gets created or when it dies. That was the constructor and destructor. Other than that, nothing's automatic. You have to do everything yourself. So C++ does the automatic call, but what happens in that automatic call is completely manual. It's like, <laughs> it's 
It's like when you're cooking and you have a pot. Okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to open the door of the pot. That's automatic. But what you're going to put in a pot to cook it, it's your responsibility. So you cannot say cooking is automatic because you've opened the pot, to the, the, the cap of the pot. You know what I mean? Everything, that it, it triggers what you need to do at the beginning. But what needs to be done at the beginning is your responsibility. And that's way ahead of the review that I was doing. It wasn't, so I just answered the question. But now, so they were asking, what if I have... Never use that. You've never heard that. In. You're like, notes, forget about it, completely out of your mind. Go, go. Auto is a very bad thing. It's bad for your health. It's bad for your environment. It's everything. It's like, it's a disaster. That auto only makes sense when you are coming to OOP 3, 4, 5, and you've got to deal with templates. So, so essentially what the, the lady over here says is that we can, you open the can of worms. Now I have to explain. Now I have to explain. So I'm not going to even save this. Just remember. So, so when you are creating a variable, so for example, in here, I am, I am doing student s equals to new student, right? I could have said over here, auto. What does it mean? The compiler looks at new looks at student, knows what is going to get returned over here is a student pointer. Therefore, automatically makes this one a student pointer. You don't have to write it. It only happens when you're initializing something. So in this case, I cannot put auto because it doesn't know auto what. First of all, that's not a thing. It doesn't know automatic I what. But if I say equals to zero, then auto works because it sees you are creating a variable out of an integer, therefore it has to be an integer. This makes absolutely no sense now. Just write student, you know what it is, why you are putting auto. But in OOP345, when you go in more advanced C, you will see that there comes a time that you are not sure what is How can I explain this now? We know inheritance, right? So we understand what, in, I, we, don't, we, we don't know how to implement it, but we know what it is, okay? Now, in the hierarchy of inheritance, sometimes it becomes so confusing that you really don't know, is it the type of its parent or it's the type of its child, which place in the hierarchy of inheritance this thing is. But you, I want to have something to put this one in. I don't know what is its type. It's not clear to me. You'll see it in 3, 4, 5, especially when we go through templates and stuff. Yes? It's shoot me now. That's the thing. <laughs> DMA? Um, so let me finish the, vec the auto first. So auto is essentially used when you want a variable of an unknown type. You don't know what the type is, and you want to have a variable to hold that type in it. That's when you say auto. You will never experience that in OP244. You always know what you have. Therefore, you create it. Therefore, forget auto at the moment. OK, please do not use auto. Yes. I think I'm recording. Yeah, it is recording. It is recording. OK, so please do not use auto. It is beyond our thing. Now, vector. Again, OOP345. Vector is an intelligent array. We are going to implement it this semester ourselves, but you are not using the library one. Uh, remember a long time ago, Apple had this uh, commercial that would say, you want that? There is an app for that. Whatever they would say, there is an app for that. There is an app for that. Like, you want to do accounting? There is an app for that. You want to find the best flavor of ice cream? There is an app for that. You want to buy a suit? There is an app for that. You want to buy a shoe? There is an app for that, right? In C++, you want to do anything? There is a template for it. There is a standard library template for it, OOP345. Vector is one of those. 
Vector is an intelligent, fast, efficient array that doesn't screw things up if you go out of the range and stuff. It's a very safe type of array. We are not using it next semester, okay? You are not to use any vectors. We will design a vector together at the end of the semester so you'll see what is the engine inside of it and how does it work. So you will see how a vector can be written, implemented. And then in OP345, you're going to have the pleasant surprise that all the things that you did in 244, there is, it is already created inside the, uh, the language called STL, Standard Template Library. Are we good? And that's Standard Template Library is what craves for auto. Because the template is so complicated, you really don't know. Like The type that you want to create is 85 of characters long, it's this dot, that dot, that dot, that dot. So you, to be able to do that, and so you just type auto to get the time. But not now. Now we have a student or an integer, make it auto. Don't make it auto, just use it. Okay, what was I talking about? I was talking about a student asking me, can I e do the dynamic memory allocation in one scope and don't delete it and delete it somewhere else? First of all, we have done this in classes. In class, in one function we allocate, in one function we deallocate, right? That's perfectly valid. But even if you are not in a class, you can actually do that, which means we could have something like this. Take a look. For example, I want a series of integers. I'm going to say allocate ints. I have a number over here that is going to be the number of things, a reference for a number. So that's going to be, this is, so I'm sending out the number of things I'm allocating. And I am returning the pointer to the allocated uh, array in here. So what happens, it says in here, I say, how many integers do you want? They're going to tell how many I allocate that much. And as you see, I am getting that in num. Therefore, outside of this code, I could therefore outside of this code I could have that type of scenario so I have a, let me just make it bigger for the for those who are at the end so now in here I'm saying so in this function allocate ints I'm doing the allocation which I'm asking how many integers do you want I get a reference of an integer, which means it's not actually in mine, but it's outside somewhere. Then I'm going to say, get the number of integers. Then I'm going to allocate the integers. Therefore, whoever is passing the value, which is size in here, will have that value afterwards. They know how many integers they have. And then afterwards, I'm ignoring the backslash. And after this, just for the, for, uh, to make sure my keyboard is clean after this. And I'm returning the ints. So this int, let's. Mm. Let's make it ints PTR because ints is a little, okay? And I'm returning that value. So if somebody wants few integers, they're going to create a variable called size, line 14 and line 15. They're going to have a pointer values in which they're going to have the, the uh, values. Then, gonna, then they're going to say allocate ints. They pass the size to it to get the size back. They are not feeding any information. They want to get the size back. So in here, the argument list is a return, a, an output port, not an input port. And uh, they say values is equal to allocated size. Therefore, size will have the value, and uh, values will have the ints, and so on and so forth. So, and if we do that, then at the end in here, we have to delete the values. OK? Why? Because the allocation is happening inside that function. Therefore, the allocation is your responsibility. So yes, we can allocate in one function and return, and then deallocate in another function if we know for real that this thing actually is doing allocation. You already have done it in C language. In C language, you are saying file pointer fptr is equal to fopen something and you open a file. And at the end you say f close fptr. What do you think you're doing? 
It is actually allocating the structure file and putting stuff in it and returning the value. So that file pointer of yours is actually pointing to a dynamic piece of memory. And when you are doing F close, F close is actually getting the address and giving it back. So if you forget to close something, you're going to have memory leak. OK? It's the same thing in here, but you are seeing the, the fact like that. So I see, again, uh, faces are kind of, do we understand this? Are we OK with this? We are not OK with this, are we? So let's walk through it just to be OK with it. So. Now in here, so I have, so, so in here now I can say something like this for, I set to zero, I less than size, and I plus plus, C in, I'm just getting the value, so now I'm going to actually write it so we can see what are we dealing with, so in here, I plus one. I am entering the values. Okay. And then I'm going to say C in into uh, values I. And then show them. So um, I'm going to say for. Again, show it in reverse order, the good old thing that we have done. So is size minus 1, i less than 0, less than or equal, uh, greater than or equal to 0, and i minus minus. And in here, I'm going to say c out values i, and I'm going to make it space separated. So, so I just want to show you what is happening in here. So let's walk through it. When I run the program, I want to have dynamic memory allocation, dynamically allocated array of integers. Doing so, doing so to be to make it modularized so you so I can later on use the exact same logic. So in future I can use the exact same logic again to allocate integer arrays. I'm writing a function for it. So we know that I if I want to do a dynamic memory allocation for an array, I need to know, I need to keep the size, and I need to keep the, the, the pointer to it. We talked about it, OK? So when I actually get to this, size is completely garbage, and values is not pointing to anything that belongs to us. Now, I am calling the allocate ints, passing the reference of size, and in return, it's going to give me the array of the integers that I have. When I get in here, it's going to tell me how many ints do I want. And I'm going to tell it I want three. So it's going to allocate three ints in num. What we know num is simply a new name for size. So the, 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 the three that I added actually set the size to three. And now it's going to ask the operating system to give three integers and puts its address in ints PTR, which is going to happen. Now, ints PTR is not going to point to any garbage. It's going to point to my garbage, OK? Three integers. And then this is going to ignore the backslash and that was entered after three. So I don't have any backslash and sitting in memory, clearing it, and returns that address back to values. And you see, now it's returned. And now values is pointing to the same place, and size is 3. So now that function allocated it. Allocated, now I'm going to say, uh, because it's not null, I'm going to say enter the ints. And one by one, I'm going to enter the integers. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So essentially, I'm putting it in the dynamically allocated memory. And as soon as I do that, I can actually print them in reverse order because these are my, my three, mem three uh, integers in memory. And after I'm done with it, I will delete it. So now it's pointing to 10. 
as soon as I delete it, it's going to be garbage again. Okay? So essentially, instead of, instead of having, so in here I'm going to say uh, 0, 1, um, DMA in a function. So, so like this, I can actually modularize my dynamic memory allocation. Now, if that's confusing, um, first of all, uh, did, did we get what I did? Is it, is it okay? I just did some dynamic memory allocation. Are we okay with this? Hopefully, kind of. No. Are we? Yes. Yeah. Just right-click, run to cursor. Yeah, or you can put a stop sign at it. So you can actually put a, uh, what we call a breakpoint. So if you want to, if you want to bypass this and stop after, just you can just do this. If you don't want to put that one, so, so, just stop. Oh no, not this because I just, this file is not the one that is getting executed. This is. Um, yeah. So you put it over here. So you are essentially doing this. You put uh, uh, the breakpoint over there, which means I want to run through the whole thing, or this one. So run through the whole thing, stop over here. So now when I run the program, it runs everything. Let me stop it. It runs everything using F5, not control F5. So it's going to say 3, enter ints, 10, 20, and 30, and then it stops over there. Now I can continue with this, okay? And you can toggle this with F9 too. So F9, if you put it over here, uh, toggles the breakpoint. They are all right in here. Step into yada, 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 and then toggle breakpoints and stuff. Toggle breakpoint, and so on and so forth. So that's one way to return an allocated memory from a function. Another way to return a memory allocated memory from a function through the argument list again can be done this way. So instead of actually, let me just, uh, yeah, instead of doing this, I'm going to return a Boolean over here to return success. And in here, I have to create a pointer to return back. Problem is that if I do that, then integer, it's when I do this, remember, I said asterisk belongs to int. So together, these mean pointer, correct? If you do it like this, you are passing the pointer by value. Therefore, the value is not going to come back. This integer comes back because it's a reference. So if I want this pointer thingy to go back, I need to make it a reference, which means the type is integer pointer reference. So now int ptr is a reference to a pointer, and therefore it's going to pass the value back out. And I do not need to create it over here anymore because it is actually the name of something that is out there. And now I can actually test and see if it fails or not, so I can uh, return something like returns being not equal to null ptr. So now this function of mine actually tells me if it is successful or not. I do not need to have two different lines in here. I take this out, and instead of having that, I'm going to say allocate, allocate ints, pass the pointer here values. It goes by reference, so it's going to come back and then uh, the size. So therefore, it's going to still allocate it and send it back to here because now, now ints ptr becomes a new name for values based on the definition of reference. And num in here becomes a new name for size, becomes an alias for size. Therefore, setting ints ptr is actually setting the values out there. And setting num is setting the size out there. 
and at the end I'm returning the success so I can literally put my function inside the if statement say if allocate int is successful uh, oh is not successful say allocation failed so therefore and this was if int ptr is not equal to null ptr it's success so it returns true therefore if it is f it is successful not true is false uh, um, and so on and so forth so this is not going to happen but if it fails then it becomes true and says allocation fail and uh, it works the exact same way uh, you want me to anybody wants me to walk through it so it's the same thing so this is um, passing back by reference So that was the question that was asked in the other class, and uh, we went through it. What else do we need over here to talk? And then we are coming to our student thingy, which I destroyed, so I have to uh, bring it back from my cheat sheet here. Student, student, student. But all these things become absolutely unnecessary when you are using a class, which means, oh, this is showing here, and in our student is what? Sorry, versions are different. This one is display, sorry, copy. Okay. That's that. So that's what we did. We created, so instead of doing all these things, we created a set function to set the, the student to whatever we want. And in our set function, we took care of all the problems of dynamic memory allocation, like making sure that we deallocate before we allocate. So we went through the, the rules of inside our initialization, we set the null pointer to name, and we called we call our manual setting of the class in a place that is called automatic, say, automatically, so nothing is automatic. The calling of the constructor is automatic, so what needs to be done to make our class work goes in the initialization, and what needs to clean up after we do our work goes into the structure that is called automatically. The destructor doesn't do anything automatically. You have to tell it what to do automatically. Okay, yes. You can make a function or just write it in a constructor if you want to. But there's like, it's, I like that better because it's more descriptive. And if there is no problem, you can actually do it. And then as we did, put the init and deallocate in a private section of a student. So nobody can use this by your, but your class. So init and deallocate, and it, it looks just more elegant to me. Okay, other than that, you could have just write this one in here and don't write an init. Okay, but deallocate, for example, I wouldn't hard code it because you need to deallocate in many different places. So for deallocate, I would simply call the deallocate. But in it, your choice. So it's all your choice. So that was the, the student thingy that we have done um, uh, for the dynamic memory allocation. With, the, with the, the set that we have done, we made sure that we deallocate before we do allocation to prevent memory leak and to make sure our deallocate doesn't crash we follow the rule of setting an unused pointer always to null ptr so at any moment you have an unused pointer a pointer that you are not using you must set it to null ptr doing so you can freely delete because if it's null we set the mechanism of ignoring null pointer is within delete if you always keep an unused pointer null then you can delete it, just in case. So if it's unused, nothing happens. If it's used, it will get deleted, and therefore you're not going to have memory leak. And that was the dynamic memory allocation we talked about. 
so that was the review of dynamic memory allocation and a little bit about constructors that we learned. And later on, we're going to learn we have several different types of constructors. So this structure is one. Done. When something is going to go away, it's the same way. So destroying something has one way. But building something, you can have so many different ways. OK? So uh, we're going to learn two major categories of three major categories of constructors this semester, which in OP344 becomes four. In here, it's only one. It's only uh, three different ones that we're going to go through. You learned one of them. That is no argument or default constructor. No argument constructor or default constructor. Next week, we're going to talk about all different types of constructors. So the review of DMA took a little long, but who cares? As long as it's useful, we're fine. So. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, 03 uh, student main. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you defined. We're going to talk about how we can actually format our code with C in and C out. You know a little bit about C in and C out. We've talked about it. I'm going to go through it completely now so you know exactly how it works. OK? So um, we, what we learned about C in and C out were these. C in, OK? We talked about C in, and we said C in is a very shy object. If something goes wrong with it, it fails, and it won't respond. OK? But because C in and C out are cousins, C out works the same way. OK? If C out fails for any reason, it won't print anything anymore. OK? So we're going to go through all these things. First of all, let's talk about C in. And C in has many functions, many, many, many functions, but there are some that we need to actually uh, uh, talk about it and understand how it works. So when we are dealing with C in, when we are working, dealing with C in, let me just close these things. We don't need them. There are a few things we need to understand. First of all, CN has a polymorphic operator that we call it extraction operator, which extracts information out of CN, which is console. So it's essentially a console input object. It receives stuff, extracts information from CN, and puts it in whatever is at right-hand side. The extraction operator is polymorph. Anything you put in front of it, it knows what it is. They're all primitive. You cannot put a student in front of it. It doesn't know. We're going to teach it later on, but it doesn't know now. OK? But for all primitive types, it knows what it is. And also uh, C strings. It understands C strings too. So with, So if I have an integer v, for a value and a character str, let's say I have 20 of them. If I can type it, of course. And let's have a character ch. OK, so for cn, and you can have a double two. It doesn't make any difference. Let's create a double two. So double value. OK, so these are the things that I have. So one thing we need to know about the, uh, the extraction operator is that the extraction operator, this is, is, it, it, these are rules about it that we need to know. So the extraction operator, which is essentially that one that extracts, OK, with C in, always leaves at least one backslash in, in keyboard. Buffer. Bugger. <laughs> Buffer. OK? So, so that's one thing you need to know. At any moment, using the extraction operator and primitive types, you read a value. After the value is read, successfully or unsuccessful, at the end, is, there is at least one backslash in. It could be lots of garbage ending with a backslash in, but there is always a backslash in left in the keyboard. You need 
to take care of that if you need to. You need to be aware of it so you can take care of it. That's number one. Number two, CN and operator for all overloads skips leading spaces, leading white spaces. What does it mean? If you are reading a character and somebody enters 50 tabs and 20 backslash ends, new lines and 200 spaces, then a character and hits enter, all those will be skipped and one character will be read. Let's try it. They designed it this way because it's leaving a backslash in. If you are leaving a backslash in a keyboard, you should ignore it the next time you're reading it, right? Because of that, they did it that way. So, so if I write something like this, for example, so let's actually do it all. I'm going to just bring them all over here. So if I receive an int, and I'm going to have a double over here too. So double value. And in here, I'm going to say double. So reading these one by one. As you see, to get an integer, All, and I'm pushing tab now, and I put over here 20. It's going to read 120. All leading spaces to what you, leading space, leading white space characters of any kind will be skipped until it hits the data. Then it picks it. Then it tries to read it. Of course, if I put APC over here, it fails. Okay? And as you see, it's standing in front of double. So that backslash N is gone. Now, if I write over here 23.45 and put spaces, enter, it's still, now the C string is stopping, which means the spaces after double are all skipped. Okay? C string, we have to remember in C string, if you enter only a string like that, the whole string with no spaces in, that's fine. But as soon as you have a space over there, the any type of white space is treated as a delimiter. What is a delimiter? A separator. It means it's a stop sign for reading. So if I write over here Fred Soleil, I'm going to crash everything. I have to only write characters. That's very fine. It reads it all. But if I had a space over there, it wouldn't work. And now I'm reading a character. So if I go all spaces, I'll go tab, I'll, and I hit enter, and I put two, let's say whatever, uh, A, and I hit enter, as you see, it reads to just one A. So all leading spaces will be skipped until it reads a character. Remember that. So extraction operator, it at least leaves one, one backslash and after. And if there is any white space before the data entry, they're all skipped. Do we understand how it works then? Okay. So, uh, what do I call it? Uh, it's a zero 04 C in and extraction. Seeding and extraction operator. Next thing. See in and get. The get function, ladies and gentlemen, is only for strings and characters. 
it is not for numbers. The get function, not get line, get. So get can be done like this. So when you're actually using, uh, uh, getting a character, get a single character, you can get it in two different ways. Either you can, so for a single character, this is how it works. First of all, it will not, first of all, it will not ignore white space characters. It will not ignore white space characters, which means when I get a character, it returns the character into CH, and I'll print it. I have to ignore because the next one is going to read. You can call get in two different ways. Either receive a character over here, or pass a reference of a character to CH to set it for you. This one returns an int. And this one returns the CN reference. Which means <clears throat> after get is done, CN is returned again. So you can actually check this for failure. So if I want to, I can actually write a code like this. I can write if cn.get ch dot fail. Do this. It means if you get it, so if, if it gets it, it's going to be true it comes out. If it fails, you can catch failure over here. With, you can't do that one with the other one because it's returning an int. Why it's returning an int? Don't ask. Too difficult thing, but it has an ASCII code. When you put it in a character, it is the ASCII code of an integer. Okay? The ASCII code of the thing. But it returns a character inside an integer. So let's put it that way. Later on, you're going to learn that uh, your keyboard has all these ASCII stuff, right? How about F1, F2, F3? How about home, insert? They are not ASCII, ASCII values. For those, the numbers get returns is greater than 256. So if you want to handle these things, it's not as easy. But if you want to handle these things, then that's why it's returning an integer. OK? So 9,562 is F1. OK? Something like that. But if you are expecting to only get a single character, don't worry. It's the ASCII code, so you can override the character without any overloading, without any, over, uh, without any overflowing. OK, so this one is going to, so you can actually do this. I'm going to make it like this so we know. OK. So I strongly recommend to always do a git ignore backslash and after all your CNs. It's just safe. You have a clear keyboard for other CNs to use. So stick to a standard because CN by itself skips all the backslash ends and always re re leaves a backslash in at the end. It's always safe to ignore it. If it's only one, one will be ignored. If there are 5,000 garbages, and then accession, they're all going to get cleaned up. So that's another one. We good with this? So that's get for a single character. Anybody wants me to run it? I don't think so. So that's cn, cn, uh, get, and cn for a single character. So if you want to get a single character, it's better to use get rather than C in extraction, because extraction will skip back white spaces. But if your intention is to actually get that space code that is coming in, or backslash T that is coming in, or backslash N that is coming in, use dot get, because get will not skip anything, and it will receive anything that comes in.
get can be used get can be used for strings too and the prototype for it is exactly identical to uh, identical to get line actually so I'm just going to bring the example over here and, and explain it so this is the single thing that I'm getting but if you want to get a C string you can say C in get strn 21 exactly like get line the difference is that get does not eat the backslash in get line eats the backslash in and throws it away get leaves the backslash in in the buffer number two when you are doing get line and if it reaches the limit seeing fails right we said that when you are doing get line if user enters and reaches the limit it will copy that 20 characters in the SDR but get line makes C and fail get will not fail get will not fail which means it will get it leave the rest in the keyboard for you to handle okay um, so that's that so in here if I if I actually, as you see over here, I have a seeing get over here. So I'm going to show it to you. When I run the program, I'm going to write over here A, enter, uh, Fred Soleil, and hit enter. And as you see, it, didn't, it did not stop at the other C in because that C in picked up the new line. You see that star? new line star to show what is printed I put the character between two stars as you see it comes over here so the next C in dot get picked up the backslash n remember get just by itself leaves the backslash n leaves whatever it is inside the keyboard okay it leaves a buffer so and it won't fail if it reaches 21 so if I actually enter something more than that so if I actually write, do something like this, a very long thing that is more than 20, if I hit it, as you see, it gets exactly 20 characters and puts it in the 21 thing and returns the A back. The rest was in keyboard. So I had lots of garbage in my keyboard when the program ended. Okay? It will not fail. If that was a get line, the next C in wouldn't have worked. So if I had get line over here, the syntax is the same. But if I run this, you will see that if I write over here and again another very long thing, then the other one will not do anything. As you see, it didn't receive anything. So it will, it will get the value, but it remains what it was before. And uh, it just fails the C in, and C in will not work uh, after that. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Uh, what else do we need to talk about here? So that's get. Um, that's get. Um, so get and so this is zero six. Get and C strings. I see many of you in your workshops use the string, the string class of C plus plus. When I ask you for the interview for your for your workshop, you better know what the string does if you are using it. If you don't know what it does, you're not going to get the mark for the workshop. Remember that. OK, I, I told you, we are not allowed to use the string class in OP244 at all. OK? The string class, standard library string class, not string header file, not C string, the string class. If you are using it, you better know what you're doing. So, because that's, you're not supposed to use it. OK? I never penalize a student because of being advanced. But if you just see a code and blindly use it and you have no idea why it works, 
that's not doing a workshop. That's trying to get a mark. All right. And again, like the students keep asking me, if you successfully, if you successfully submit your work, and you see, oops, there is a problem. I want to fix it. You can resubmit. You can even get an extension and resubmit it, and you will not get penalized for late. You are on time because you're correcting an already working code. That is uh, admirable. That's good. I thank you to do that. Okay, so if you're correcting your code and resubmit it, if you are late or anything, you're not going to lose mark. You are considered to be on time. Okay, yes. Pardon me? Workshop one will be marked this week. Workshop two when it's over. So when it's due date is over, then workshop two will be marked. So you're going to get the... You're fine. Yes, 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 yes. What you have, if it's past due date of submission, then you have to ask for extension. Tell me, like, like literally tell me that, far that I made a mistake, I want to fix it. And you will see that when you're submitting it, it's going to give you a due date not with an extension, as, and, and we're going to say correcting a mistake. You're going to see that, that it actually comes in the submitter. Okay? So I know. All right, so that's that. Get line we already know. We don't need to uh, go through it again. Get line we already know what it is. It works, uh, and you can set the delimiter to whatever you want. Uh, it get is works the same way too. You can change if you add the third argument to get. You are saying I want I don't want backslash and to be delimiter. I want something else to be delimiter, and it works the same way. So get line reads that one until it hits a, a, a comma, and if I get to 21, and it doesn't get to the delimiter, then it fails. I can it will actually show me that it's too long or too whatever. So and we've already worked on this. Anybody wants me to walk through this, or we already because we've already worked on this many times. Okay? That's the get line. Now good stuff are coming. So now we're going to go to formatting. That's foolproof reading. We want if we want to do foolproof reading, these are the things we needed. Um, 07 get line and C string. So, first thing about C in and C out. So let's actually put these values in here and start working with them. So I want to print these values, but in a formatted way. I don't just I just don't, don't want to print it widely. So what do I do? Um, if I print them as they are using the insertion operator for C out, for all the non-floating point values, it's going to print what you see. So what you see is what you get. But for floating point values, the C++ decides what is a good way of showing it. So every time, it may be different. So now it's decided that I don't need to have that much thing afterwards. I'm just going to show three of them. So the insertion operator and C out and double and float and long double, it has a mind of its own. And it changes based on the value inside the variable. For example, if I set the DV to and I want to print that, then the output's going to be. As you see, it went to scientific notation. So over here, printed it like this. Over there, printed it like that. So it decides how to print it. This means this number multiplied by 10 to power minus 6. That value is 2.34456 multiplied by 10 to power of minus 6. 
that creates that. Okay? That's scientific notation. All right? So just letting you know. So I'll, I'll teach you how to not, so you can actually tell to see how to, to stop doing that. I, I, I'm going to tell you how to print and print everything like that. You can actually say that. The first thing we need to actually, so, uh, so let me actually do it one more. Just I want you to see that. There you go. Now it's back to normal. But this time it decides I'm going to show you five digits on the decimal point. So, yeah. Anyways. So, you can actually ask the C out to print the values in a specific width. So, I can actually do something like this. I can say C out. So, in here I'm showing uh, an asterisk. And that's it. Okay. And after that, I'm going to say C out dot width. So I'm actually telling set your width to say 20. Okay. And after that, I'm going to print anything you, so you can print anything you want. It's going to be printed in 20. So now in here, I'm going to say IV and I'm going to go to uh, put an asterisk again and go to new line. And if I run this, you will see that it actually prints it in 20 spaces. So you can, but you have to understand that this happens only on the immediate next printout. So now if I print CH over here afterwards, so if I actually do something like, oh, sorry. If I actually print, for example, the uh, CH in here, it's going to still be CH and right at the beginning, so there is no width for the other one, as you see. So if you want every single one of them to pr get printed in the width of 20, unfortunately, for every single one of them, you have to actually put a width beforehand. So this is how you need to do. You need to say, okay, a star with 20, print this one. Now star with 40, print that one. And as you see, now when I actually print this, it is going to print everything in a specific width. Are we okay with this? So now we, we know how to set the width. Now we know how to set the width. We need to see how, to, how we can justify things to left and right. That's pretty simple. Ju left justified or right justified, you only do it once. And it takes effect for all the printouts after. So let me actually put this thing at right and put this one at left. Okay. So in here, if I would just say right over here before I want to do that, if I say, um, uh, C out dot set F, and I'm going to say iOS left. So I'm saying set the justification bit to left, and now if you print it, you will see that all the things that you have will be left justified. So it's still the asterisk at right shows that it, it is actually printing it in 20 spaces, but it's like that. So if I want to bring it back, Bring it now back to right. I can actually set to iOS right. And now, the, for the next printout, everything's going to go to right. You see that? Are we OK with this? Here's the part that is tricky. So now let's bring it back again to left. So I am going to do this. And now I'm going to go back to left. C 
See what's going to happen? It's not going to work. For some reason that I cannot explain now, you can set a left to right, but you cannot set a right to left. There, don't worry, there's a remedy for that. What you need to do is to always undo what you have done. So if you're done with, if you are done with left justification, say that you're done. So say C out, so dot unset F iOS left. And then in here, say C out dot unset F iOS right. And again, C out dot. So get used to it just to be safe. It is always better to undo what you have done. It's like, uh, yeah, you just got to make sure that you undo what you have done. And now when you write it, everything is going to go perfectly in their positions. Left and right and left. Are we OK with this? Now, what if I want the empty spaces to get filled with something else? If you want to do that, that's a, a permanent thing too. So in here, I can say uh, C out dot fill. I'm going to say fill it with dots. But as soon as, I, as soon as you do that, everything is going to be dots now. So to change it back, there is no unset for this one because it doesn't make sense. You simply say C out dot fill back to space now. And then for the other one, say C out fill say a dash. So now I can have different types of fills for whatever I want. The first one is with dots, the second one is spaces, and the third one is with dashes. OK? You good? <laughs> so this one, 0, 8, C out, fill, left, right, dot CPP. Is there anything else? Left justification and width. The next one is how to make the double to get printed the way I want it. For that, you have to tell to see out, hey, don't do your own thing. I'll tell you how doubles are printed. And this is only for doubles and nothing else. So you say see out dot set, and you say iOS fixed. So don't try to do stuff. I'll tell you what to do. Always be fixed to this format. And now you can say something like see out dot precision, say three digits after the decimal point. Now when you print, everything, you see, that's three. Even the one that had lots of stuff is going to just print three zeros because that's what you asked for. And the other one is going to be 1.234. Let's make it, let's make it, Let's make it, let's make it, let's make it. What do I do? What do I do? So one, two, three, four. I'll make it five. Precision five. There is a reason for it just to demonstrate something. So let's do it one more time. Now, when you are setting the precision, it always rounds the last one. So it was one, two, three, four, five, six, correct? Because there is a 5, and after 5 there is a 6, it rounds the 5 to 6. But in the other one, it remained what it was. OK? So be aware of that. OK, so it actually rounds it. Um, uh, what else? We have 
we talk about it. That's it. So that's all we need to know about uh, formatting all the numbers. So that gives you power to print anything any way you want. OK? It is very object oriented. It's not like C that you put percent dash 2.2 LF and then dash to left justify and things like that. You literally tell the objects how to print in the next thing. And this one is going to be C out fixed precision. Yes. Pardon me? You don't need to. Unless you, you want it to go back to its own mind, yeah. If you unset, then it's going to go back to its crazy way. <laughs> OK? Your choice. Sometimes you want to just print, uh, want to want the compiler to decide, want the system to decide how to print it. No problem with that. But if you unset it, beautiful question. If you unset it, it goes back to, so your precision don't mean anything after that. OK? And last but not least, have anybody seen triplets of Belleville? No? It's a cartoon. It's an actually a beautiful one. It's an adult one, but triplets of oh. Anyway. So I said C in and C out are cousins, right? But C out is actually a triplet. There are three of them. C out, C log, C error. These are identical objects, and they have nothing to do with their names. They are all C outs. But as a standard, you always use C log for your loggings. And you always use C error to print critical messages. Not that the number is less than five. Why, why did you do that? You, like, not, not error messages for validations to users. But real critical things like you are you expected the file to be open and it's supposed to, and it didn't work. Something's wrong. Then you put C, C error. Why? Because C out is is shy like C in. If something goes wrong with it and it cannot print, you need an outlet to print with. That's C error. Okay. You can manually not for C for C in and C out. For both of them, you can manually, yourself, set them in a failure state. You can do that. So for example, if I want to show things with a log, so in here I would say, um, if C out, if you just say if C out, you'll learn how to do this soon, it actually returns its success. So it returns false, and the same thing for C in. You can say if C in. If you write if C in, it actually, if C in is not a failure, if will happen. If C in is a failure, else will happen. But you can use fail to, to just, or if you say not C out, the same thing. That means so. So if not C out and dot fail, and the same thing for C in is the same. By the way, the failure comes from their parents. That's why it knows both of them know. OK? C in and C out, they both come from iOS. There we have an iOS, and out of iOS, we have multiple inheritance. We have, sorry, we have inheritance, and uh, two objects, iStream and OStream, are derived from there. So the failure system comes from them. That's why it's identical in both of them. So if I say C in, it works with C out too, and vice versa. So if C in fails in here, I have to say C error can't print, C out is dead, or sleep, OK? So if we have such a case, so in, in this case that I just mentioned, so I can actually manually set C out into a failure state. So if I print this now, and let's do some more printing, so in here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write all these good stuff over here. So <clears throat> as you see now, I have C error, I have C log, I have C out, and they all work perfectly, right? So 
If I run this program now, obviously C in is C out is not in a failure state. It's going to actually print it, print the double, and then it's going to actually show messages on how things are getting printed. So printing double over here. But if I do not want the logs to get printed, I want to stop the log to printing log messages. I can say C log dot set state to iOS fail bit. That manually sets C log to fail. I can clear it to remove it. But if I do that now, you see at left, I see all those printing, double printing stuff. If I run this now, those are not going to get printed because C log is in a fail state. When it's in a fail state, they are shy. They don't do anything. And if I set C out into a fail state now, You will see that the error, oops. You will see that the error message is going to get printed. Can't print C out of sleep. So how come the second one worked? Because I cleared C out then. Yes? Why would you ever need to set uh, a C out to the fail state? C out you don't, but C log, imagine, right? Imagine you write debugging statements. And you want to see the value of different things. And you have it everywhere. And you want to turn it off and see how it works. Isn't it better to have a C log to just poof, turn everything off? All the debugging statements will be gone. It's much easier. C error, we know why. OK, but C log, OK. And C out doesn't fail. But soon we learn that its, it's children will fail. I told you that C iOS is, is the parent of iStream and OStream, right? These two have two children, IFStream and OFStream, which deal with files. So you write in a file exactly how you write in a, on a screen. And if the file cannot be opened or it's not readable, they fail. So, I'm just demoing to you to see how easy it is. You don't need to create C in C out, C log, or C error because they are all talking about an existing thing. So you don't need to create them. But files are manual. You want to create a file. That's why if I include IF stream, it's just a demo. We'll go into details later on. It is in F stream. So F stream holds both of them. I can actually write over here, um, let's put it over here. So I can write over here something like uh, OF stream. That is a child of O stream that is actually C out. And I'm going to say my file, and I'm going to say mm, whatever, data.txt. And in here, exactly like I did that one, instead of C out, I'm going to say my file. Right? And if I run the program now, it ran, right? See what happens here. If I actually open this, data.txt, look at it. One, two, three, one, two, three. That's beauty of, of inheritance. So when they wanted to write in files, they didn't create a new thing. They said, we already have all the system of reading and writing. Let's just use the exact same thing in files. So any way you are learning your C out, get ready for it. You use the exact same thing to do it in files. You are reading from keyboard C in, you can do an IF stream and read from a file. As easy as that. So there is no need for teaching. That's why I just demoed it to you. When the time comes, I'm just going to say, hey, it's exactly like C in and C out. Now go. OK? So be aware of it. It's very. Uh, interesting thing to do, and I'm going to remove it because it's going to freak people out who don't do this. But it's again, it's not rocket science. It's the exact same thing. So if you do justification, like left justified, right, everything works in files too because it's simply a child of. Okay, and that's when C out fails when you cannot open a file or something like that. Oh, let me just remove this one too. 
And as you see, I didn't need to close it. Why didn't I need to close it? Why didn't I need to close the file? Why don't I, why do you think I don't need to close the file? Because any sane programmer would have closed the file in the destructor of the class. Right? So the people who designed it, I can manually close it, but the people who designed it in the destructor of the file object, they close it. So you don't need to close anymore. You just open your file, do your work with it. If you want to manually close it and do something else, you can. Otherwise, it's going to get closed. That's the automatic thing you were talking about. <laughs> All right? It's not automatic. They use the feature to make it automatic. Are we okay down to this point? And we can use this to write foolproof applications for receiving information from CN. So you can actually check the CN if CN fails. So let's say you are writing your own code. And in your code, let's say you are writing your own code. And in your code, let me just save this. So this one is C out fail state. C out family <laughs> and fail state. Okay. Now the next thing I wanted to show you is this. To follow the standard of receiving information from CN, when you want to write a foolproof thing, let's say I want to actually receive an integer. That I want to receive a mark. Okay, so I write void get mark. Okay, and in here I'm going to say integer reference mark. So that's what I want to do. Are we okay with this? All right. So I want to follow the standard of CN. So what do I do? I'm going to say CN into mark, right? Then I'm going to say if mark is less than 0 or mark is greater than 100, it is invalid, right? I'm not going to print an error message. I'm going to say CN.set state set state to iOS fail bit. So the person using my get mark can use it exactly as they use CN. So they can get the mark, then say if CN.fail, bad mark. So when they are writing this code, oh, 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 I'm changing the wrong file again. No, don't say. So take a look in here. Now I'm going to come down and go like this. I'm going to say integer mark, uh, get mark, mark, if not cn, I'm going to say c out invalid mark. Or you can write a loop, do something with it, whatever. And and then again, I was a CN dot clear exactly as I did, and then say CN dot ignore and else see out you got. Okay, so if I run this program now. If the mark thingy that I have, oh, I forgot to actually put a prompt, sorry. Uh, stop, stop, stop. Invalid mark, obviously. Um, I'm going to say, see out. So one more time. So now if I enter mark, although as you see I entered ASDF, it failed. But now if I put 400, it will still fail. 400 is an integer. It successfully read it. But because it didn't match it, I manually put CN in a fail state. 
So I can treat all my input errors the same way as CN does. That's why we set it to fit. Are we okay with this? Now you know everything about CN and CL. You can do anything you want with these. Every, and you will see that we're going to make wondrous stuff using these things. We're going to do some very nice stuff when we get to operator overloading. Learn how to do operator overloading, okay? After constructors, we're going to do operator overloading, and that's going to be it. Um, any questions? Suggestions? Objections? Yes. Leading zeros. Tell it, just run it through me again. So if. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. How you spin? set, so first you set width to two, you make it right justified, and set fill to zero. Yeah. Right? Easy. Again, every, you can do anything you want. Anything you want. So again, he was saying, like, how do I print leading zeros? If I have number, it's like a six-digit number, and like student number. A student number is nine digits, right? And some of them start with zero. So when you're actually reading it, that zero is gone. So instead of zero, four, two, it becomes four, two. How do I print that zero for a student number leading zero? So you set the width to nine. You set the number to be right justified. You set the fill to zero, and you print it. If it's five digits, it's got to be right justified and a zero at left. OK? You want me to do it? or? Okay. okay, that's it. That's the lecture for today. And now you are perfectly on track on everything. I'm just going to push these. Yeah, this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to change something over there. Take a seat, I'll come to you, because it's difficult to wait. It's easier to come to you. So I'll go to the gentleman, then.